It's the 13th night of Halloween. With the That Gets My Coat chat, Rich Outfield and Big Anchorage. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome. This is Big Anklevich. And this is Rich Outfield. And welcome to another episode of the 13 Nights of Halloween. That's right. If you're just joining us. Well, start with number one. What the f*** is wrong with you? Jeez. Seriously. Wait. You wouldn't have I put was, it that way, I, I take yeah, it? Yeah, I might have put it a little gentler, but that's okay. You know, we do want these listeners to come back again next time uh, anyways yes uh we've got uh this is kind of what we would call the culmination of our uh whole marathon it's like the last few miles here yeah we we have a story by each of us and uh today is the day we get to the story by senor richard outfield let's see the story is called on dusty wings and yes, this story was written for the 13 Nights of Halloween. Specifically for the 13 Nights of Halloween. So we're going to go ahead and get to it and uh, hopefully you enjoy it. And we'll see you on the flip side, which means after the story. The feedback. Hey, stop that. You knew I was going to say it. <laughs> All right. We'll see you in a bit, folks. Enjoy the story. On Dusty Wings by Rish Outfield. Herbert had heard there would finally be rain that weekend. That's what the woman on Channel 5 Weather had said, and they were supposed to be the news specialists. So he'd gone to the cabin that Friday because it was going to be a terrible few days, weather-wise. Wonderful. He had left his toolbox, laptop, and building materials at the cabin three months ago. He'd like to have had his stuff, though not at that kind of risk. But if it was raining, miserable weather, no moths would be out, they'd all be hiding, sleeping, maybe dead. That was what the lady on Channel 5 had said, anyway. And he had listened to her. He'd worn his full-body cover, though, on the drive, and kept the windows rolled tight and the vent off. Nobody could be too careful. Not with only 30% of men left alive and whole. He'd gotten to the cabin late in the day because the roads were no longer maintained, and nearly stuck himself in the mud getting to his now-deceased father's property. Through the windshield, the sky was gray and dreary, even though it was only 7 in the afternoon. He did not want to be out at night, not even in his truck. Night was when they came out. The moths now ruled the night. But the rain poured down so hard that visibility dropped, and he could barely see to keep his truck on the road. He got to the cabin, grabbed his belongings, loaded it up in the bed of the truck, then trudged back inside. He'd realized he was going to have to spend the night at the cabin, as daunting as that sounded. Better that than driving through flooded, dangerous roads in the dark. Luckily, the rain kept up, and he felt safe, despite the darkness encroaching outside. He sat on his couch, chain-smoking cigarettes, trying to watch a Blu-ray, and twitching nervously every time he saw a shadow move, or imagined a shadow moving. A scientist in Winnipeg had done it, apparently, experimenting with some kind of nerve agent that either accidentally or intentionally infected the moths in her region. She had claimed to be the one responsible in a video statement released to the internet and news outlets, including Channel 5. But there was no proof she really was the one who did it, and there were others taking credit or suggesting blame. But whether it was on purpose or accidental, the moths she had infected passed on their contagion and flew far and wide, spreading the toxin that made moths more aggressive, but also much more deadly to those they encountered. The nerve agent in the moth's wings did not affect women at all, nor male children before puberty. But men, young and old, reacted violently when infected, and seemed to have an overwhelming urge to mutilate themselves in the genitals. 
It had seemed like a joke at first. The reporters on TV and the speakers on the radio had called it a hoax. Then a group of religious fanatics. And then a wave of irrational copycats. But once the number was up over a thousand, and once there was documented evidence that those little ordinary looking moths were behind it, there was nothing short of panic across North America. Moths, apparently, can thrive in all but the coldest climes, and since the plague began in the first week of July, there were very few places moths did not gather, fly, crawl, or lurk. People started booking flights to Australia, New Zealand, Chile, and the Poles hoping to get away from the moths' summer hunting grounds. One 747 crashed on the way to Buenos Aires as the pilot and co-pilot castrated themselves mid-flight. Moths could get into luggage and clothing, so soon other countries closed their borders to male Americans, Canadians, and wealthy Mexicans, and soon to every person from that area of the world. People cut down trees, made fires, and sprayed poisons into the air, killing themselves and their children, and started taking extraordinary measures to protect themselves. But it didn't always work. The President of the United States perished by his own hand, and the Vice President refused to leave the clean room he had built for himself in Seattle. People in cities fared better than people in the countryside, but whatever had made the moths more aggressive had also made them hardier, longer lived, and able to fly farther than scientists would have guessed possible. Herbert had been afraid, as much as any man, but had been very careful, and found a few benefits to the world situation. He hadn't slept with the same woman twice since this ordeal began, and found himself wealthy, having lost his father, uncle, and two brothers in one year. Winter was right around the corner, and the women on all the news programs and talk shows were saying that the moths hibernate or die once the seasons change. So, why had he needed his tools and materials so much? He had money to buy a new laptop. Why couldn't he have waited until it was 40 degrees out instead of 60? He could have bought new stuff, couldn't he? Instead of taking such a stupid risk? Those were his thoughts when suddenly the rain on the roof overhead started to abate. The lightning in the sky became more and more intermittent, and the cabin around him felt more and more vulnerable. He had covered himself up like a beekeeper when he went out to the shed where the generator was, afraid that the horrible gray creatures would swarm at him when he opened the door, but he hadn't seen any. That wasn't entirely true. There had been a dead moth in a spider's web in one of the corners, and the virologist said the toxin was still infectious even if the moth was dead. Now that bodysuit was safe in his pickup truck. While he was here, hands, face, and neck open to the elements, shivering as the storm died away. He would be fine. He just had to be calm, try to find a way to sleep until morning. He'd taken a couple of the allergy pills his brother, now dead by his own hand, and a gardening trowel, used to take up here, complaining about how drowsy they made him. But Herbert hadn't even yawned yet. The couch was too uncomfortable, the air too stale, his mind too active. There came a sound at the window, a light thump, as though someone had flicked their finger against the glass. He swiveled his head to look. Something flittered out there, then was gone. It could have been a bird, or a wasp, or something. Maybe a fly, a harmless, welcome fly. Flick. No. It was a moth. A colorless insect half an inch in wingspan striking the window. All the saliva in his mouth quickly went somewhere else. Maybe evaporated completely. Flick. At the other window, the sound came again. This one was louder. He looked. There were three, maybe five moths against the glass, all moving, taking flight, then landing again. Sometimes they made a sound when their wings hit the glass. Sometimes they were silent. Their legs scrabbled. Their antennae twitched. They wanted to get in. Get in at him. No. They merely wanted to get in because he had lights on inside. 
Moths had always been drawn to light, ever since they flittered out of Lucifer's beastie workshop, the ugly bastard cousin of God's holy butterfly. Herbert rose and flipped the switch on the light above him. Half of the room was bathed in darkness. He crossed and flipped the light above the couch off. Now there was only dark all around him. Through the window, there was still the occasional bit of distant lightning as the storm gave up for now. He sat there a long time. He could hear his breathing, too loud in the lightless cabin. Flick. He heard one of them hit the glass. Flick. Flick. It was dark in there. Why would they want to get in now? The answer was obvious. Herb liked his genitals. They had done him good for more than a decade now. Sure, he'd knocked up a girlfriend or two and mounted a waitress who was not entirely willing, but other than that, his salami and meatballs had never steered him wrong. He tried to quiet his breathing and realized he was shivering, though it wasn't all that cold in here. Flick. Was that on the glass outside or inside the cabin with him? He imagined them on the walls creeping toward him or circling in that mindless, clumsy way they had, acting like he was a streetlight on any city block. Flick! That sounded like a big one. He'd seen moths that were five, six inches long, with these disturbing, fuzzy growths on their grotesque heads, like tarantula legs. What if some of those were waiting outside, hoping to get at him, to spread their disease? He couldn't stand being in the dark like this, not knowing. He had to turn on the light, just for a moment, just to check. He flipped the switch. For a moment, he was blinded by the light, like that song that mentions douches over and over again. But a second later, he could see again. There was a dozen on one of the windows, ten or so on the other. They knew he was still there. They wanted him dead. He flipped the light off again. Darkness seemed to be absolute now, both inside and out. He tried hard to think of anything besides what lurked just beyond the glass. Flick. A bigger one that time. Louder. How many moths would it take to break the glass? He'd never heard about that happening on the news before. But it could, if they got smart and moved at once. The way a bird could break a windshield if it hit it just right? Flick, flick! Why wouldn't they leave him alone? They wanted him to be afraid. That's what the Canadian scientist who had claimed to have designed the plague said. That finally men would know the terror of the male member the way women had since the dawn of time. Suddenly something flew past Herbert's ear. It didn't make a sound, but he felt it fly by. He flailed and cried out and batted at the air. He felt no moth, but heard them conspiring at the windows, thumping as they drove their bodies in an attempt to get at him. Had he imagined it? Had a moth just touched him then flew away? And if so, had he been infected? How fast would it take? Would he even know when it happened? When his Uncle Bill had died, he hadn't even had time to take off his sunglasses. Just started attacking his own private parts with a screwdriver until he bled to death. Herbert had to know. He flipped the light on again, it having been off for so short a time his eyes didn't even have to accustom themselves to it. There were no moths near him that he could see, but there were an awful lot of shadows in the room where they could be hiding. Flick, flick. Now that the light was on, the moths outside redoubled their efforts. He gave them the finger and reached for the lamp switch once again. Then he paused. There was a moth crawling slowly on the ceiling above him. It was a tiny, pitiful-looking one, with the wings permanently swept back, but it could drop on him at any time, if it wanted to. Herbert had to go to the bathroom, a great deal all at once. He thought maybe he could sneak across the room and into the bathroom, then close the door, put towels down by the crack under the door, and hide out until daylight came or until the rain started up again, chasing the monsters back to shelter. He slowly stood, watching that repugnant insect as it crawled away from him along the ceiling. 
It kept going until it reached the fireplace. The fireplace had three moths already on it. The flue went up and out of the cabin, the chimney rising to the roof where it had a wire mesh on it to keep out birds and vermin. But very tiny moths could get through the wire, as these had. The opening to the fireplace was shrouded in darkness, but he thought he saw movement there. He had to run. He took a single step toward the bathroom and felt something light on the back of his neck. He slapped at it with such a force that he actually stumbled. His hand now held a smear of gray moth particles. He recoiled from his own hand, as though it were, well, infected, was really the best word. He still could make it to the bathroom if he ran right now. A moth took flight from the fireplace, fluttering haphazardly around eye level. It was headed his way. Herbert ran, ran as he planned to, into the kitchen, batting at the air around him. He slammed into the cupboard, making a high-pitched keening noise now, and fumbled at one of the drawers. A moth landed in his hair. <coughs> he heard himself moan and pulled the drawer open, shaking his head wildly. There were moths in his underwear. He was sure of it. They were laying their eggs down there. There was one way he could stop them. He reached into the knife drawer. So that was our presentation, our story for today, on Dusty Wings by Rish Outfield. Now, we're going to go ahead and go. This is the end of today's episode. Tomorrow, if you want to come back, we will discuss the story. We will discuss the story. Indeed. And <laughs> talk about our kind of like a regular episode of the show, except for Split in Two. So, yeah, we'll see you again tomorrow. And uh, we'll discuss... On Dusty Wings by Rish Outfield. See everybody then. Good night. Happy Halloween. <laughs> that Gets My Go is produced under a Creative Commons okay. 3.0 license. This show is lame. As lame as Rish Outfield? No, not that lame. Herbert. The guy's name is Herbert? Is that Bobby? That's like the oldest old person name ever. Is this guy 90? No. Well, he needs to be. Rewrite it. What's the uh, tone of this story? I'm assuming scary. I should be like, Herbert, it heard there would finally be rain all weekend. I'm Batman. Uh. He did not want to be out at night. Not even in his truck. Night was when they came out. That again. Mostly. <laughs> I mean, <Yes. laughs> a scientist in Winnipeg had done it. A scientist in Regina had done it. Apparently. That would have been better. <laughs> Contagion. Humiliation. Defecation. But men, young and old, reacted violently when infected and seemed to have an overwhelming urge to mutilate themselves in the genitals. In the genteels. Is that how I spelled it? <laughs> yeah, you got the I after the T. In the gentials. No, not my gentials. <laughs> <clears throat> now that bodysuit was safe in his pickup truck. Yeah, I don't get it either. Why did he put it in his truck? I don't know. Because the story had to have him not have it. So you're saying this person in the horror story did something stupid that didn't make any sense? <laughs> Could have been a bird or a wasp or something. Maybe a fly. A harmless, welcome fly. He would like to see a whole kingdom of flies. He didn't care. All the saliva in his mouth quickly went somewhere else. Maybe evaporated completely. Maybe came out of his butthole. <laughs>
He soiled himself. It was saliva. <laughs> um, the outtakes won't be as fun because people can't see your face. <laughs> well, if only he'd been able to gleek, it would save him. There you go. Time. Could have saved his, his life if but only. He, was, he had never learned how to gleek. He'd never been able to do it. <laughs> it was dark in there. Why would they want to get in now? The answer was obvious. Herb liked his genitals. Not just like the way you like things on Facebook. He really liked them. He liked using them. He liked the idea of having genitals. Just everything about genitals he liked. The first short story collection by B.D. Enklevich. <laughs> everything about genitals. <laughs> It's like a Dr. Seuss book, except for it's about genitals. I like my genitals. I do. I would play with them with me. I would play with them with you. Uh. How many moths would it take to break the glass? He'd never heard about that happening on the news before. But it could. If they got smart and moved at once, the way a bird could break a windshield if it hit it just right, or all the fish, if they swam down at once, could make the fishing net break. Keep on swimming. Just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. That's the point of this story. Is that was a big fart, and you just looked off to the side like it was something from upstairs, huh? It was something from upstairs. <laughs> had he imagined it? Had a moth just touched him, then flew away? And if so, had he been infected? How fast would it take? He grabbed a knife and cut his schlong off. That's how fast. It just occurred to me, why didn't he just, like, wrap himself in blankets? Or something. <clears throat> Shoot. Or why did he put his super suit in the car and leave it there? There was one way he could stop them. He reached into the knife drawer and made a sandwich. The end. The end. <laughs> That's the end? <laughs> I was going to let you talk, but let me let me do I it like you do. Wait. Uh, okay, I, I've talked for a long time. You talk. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, the other day. Oh, now this is interesting. And then you interrupt because you can't <laughs> allow me to continue talking. Uh, Ooh, that fart was so powerful. It lifted me off the chair. Nice. And I didn't nice. think to put the microphone down there where you all could participate. That's a, that's a much scarier story than anything that we've shared so far in this episode. And a burp to go with it. Nice. <laughs>